this is going to be the second part to the vlog where I read books based on my big six of my astrology chart. Um, if you want to check out more about that concept and hear about the first two books that I read, you'll definitely want to watch part one. Um, but this is going to be um, the middle part of this vlog series. It turned into something a lot larger, so it is a three-parter. I also got Page Boy by Elliot Page, um, who is also a Pisces. Um, and I got this specifically for this vlog. I'm, I was going to get it either way, but this is what I'm going to be reading for my Mercury in Pisces. And it's good that I'm doing this one um, so much earlier than I initially thought because we just talked about Pisces Sun. You have hopefully a relatively okay grasp at what that looks like. This is going to be similar vibes, but looking not at like self and who you are, but instead how you communicate, how you communicate and how you think. Um, so the mutable water, the the flexibility and adaptability, but also maybe flakiness, maybe, um, especially with the emotionality, it could be a little turbulent, right? Um, uh, but there is a high focus on intuition and emotion, kind of perhaps uh, getting lost in your thoughts. So, at their best, Mercury and Pisces think and communicate creatively and poetically. Um, they rely a lot on their intuition, and um, there can be a large focus on music, the arts, and spirituality, psychic stuff. They can be scattered. Um, one of the books specifically said it's like the uh, um, absent-minded professor archetype. And one thing that's important to remember when talking about Pisces, um, Mercury and Pisces, is that um, Mercury is not comfortable in Pisces. Uh, so you might be familiar with the fact that each of the planets is ruled by a particular sign. In this case, Mercury is ruled by Gemini and Virgo. They are the most comfortable there. That's kind of the energy that the planet sort of naturally has. Um, Pisces is opposite Virgo. Now, when two planets um, or anything like that are opposite each other, there's a tension there. Um, so when the planet is um, opposite where it wants to be, the energy can be really watered down or even negative. Um, so Pisces is not necessarily super effective or comfortable communicator. And I can see that in my real life. I'm not very good at making things concise, which you probably know if you're sitting here watching a God knows how long, honestly, video. <laughs> and the fact that I regularly put out 30 minute videos. Um, I'm not very concise. And I sometimes struggle a lot with how to describe certain things that I'm thinking or feeling. Now in terms of the house, um my Mercury is in the ninth house, which is the same place my son is in. So that means that I tend to like to think and talk about areas relating to education and spirituality um, and travel um, when I'm expressing kind of in the most positive way. Um, Mercury in the ninth house can be curious are always studying um, with a strong moral compass and kind of some of the negative sides can be a sort of dogmatism. That's kind of the, the whole bit on ninth house, generally speaking. Kind of a little bit everywhere, um, sort of hard to pin down words and effectively communicate, but still very much invested in knowledge and education. Um, that's where my Mercury is at. And now... I can move to my computer so that we can dig into Elliot Page's chart. Okay, so here we are. Um, I think that it's funny and worth noting, um, especially as we're talking about, like, Pisces being a difficult place for Mercury to be in. I filmed 
that description of Mercury <laughs> Pisces twice <laughs> in order to actually get it how I wanted it to be. Um, that's just funny. So, we're going to take a look at Elliot Page's um, birth chart. So, we don't have a birth time. However, we do have the place and the date, which is primarily what we need. Um, Pisces Sun um, and Pisces Mercury. That's like one of the reasons why I chose him is because I saw that he had both. Um, uh, now, his Mercury is in retrograde. Now, people do usually think of like the negative parts of Mercury in retrograde. Um, electronics, like, I mean, when Mercury is currently in retrograde, there's, like, issues with electronics and issues with communication. Um, but it's not all bad. You know, sometimes it means that you have to kind of circle back, maybe think about things in a different way. So looking at natal Mercury in retrograde, that could mean that they communicate differently. Maybe um, writing versus talking or um, maybe not talking at all and maybe communicating through art. Um, it's just one example of how it could potentially kind of manifest itself. Um, uh, they could have a harder time talking, certainly, too. Um, but retrograde... Um, doesn't necessarily mean one thing and isn't necessarily always bad. So that's something to kind of think about. I mean, clearly it's not all bad if he's managed to do everything that he's doing. Um, I mean, he literally wrote a book, so he can at least communicate a little bit, right? In a retrograde, I wonder, it could also, um, you know, you sometimes have to take longer to meditate on certain things, maybe take longer to say certain things, um... Which could be an interesting way to look at, like, his timeline of coming out, potentially. So, Pisces Sun, Pisces Mercury, Sagittarius Moon, which, um, the ninth house is ruled by Sagittarius, so we've kind of inadvertently talked at least a little bit about some of the vibes. Um, so, very adventurous, adventurous, open-minded, um interested in like philosophy and education uh potentially um reckless or um like too much pent-up energy there's a word for that it's not in my head right now flighty a little bit um uh but very passionate energetic wanting to do a lot of different things wanting to learn a lot of different things um, and then we have Venus and Capricorn and Mars and Taurus. So both of those are earth signs. Um, Sagittarius is a fire sign, especially with it being a memoir. I think the Mercury sign is going to be very prevalent because they're literally like communicating, but I think that, um, the moon and Venus will probably show up on it because Venus is over love, which a lot of people know, but also art. Art is a very Venusian, um, realm. So I wonder how much of like the earth kind of element we're going to see as well as fire because, um, memoirs are about like personal experience and emotion can be central to that, especially when we're a uh, water sign twice over. Um, so it'll be interesting to see those elements how they come out. Um, I know for sure that, uh, this is told non-linear, um, which I've seen a lot of people really like. I've seen some people confused by it. I like that. I think it's neat. And I also think that's a very potentially Piscean sensibility. I could see that being something that someone with a heavy Pisces placement would decide to, um, not that we have a monopoly on it, but, um, yeah, so, uh, 
that's Elliot Page's chart, and we'll shortly get into his book. It is February 15th. I don't know how many days that makes it since I've checked in last, but I finished Page Boy, and I really enjoyed it. This is Elliot Page's biography. Um, I think uh, he's best known for roles, his roles in Juno and the Umbrella Academy. Um, and this is uh, told very non-linear, and I really enjoyed like his choice to do that. I thought that he used it really well. The, th the things that he was able to talk about, um, it still felt like there was an order despite it being non-linear, if that makes sense. Um, and it's not just that one chapter is in one setting and then one chapter is in another, but there's a little bit of fluidity within the chapters, which I thought was really cool. Um, I also really enjoyed his writing and how he described certain things, especially certain um, emotional things. Um, was really compelling and sometimes very relatable. Um, uh, I resonated with some of the things that he had to say about the um, feeling of being closeted. Um, in certain aspects of gender dysphoria, but also just the, like, penchant for escapism that is very Piscean, um, is very relatable. Um, there's also a whole lot in here about his family and love life and stuff. Um, it's all very interesting, very cool. Um, I think a really good insight into, in some ways, what being queer was like at this particular time that he was getting bigger and uh also like being queer in Hollywood like he talks about this dynamic of how queerness is used as a certain currency but only by certain people like straight people playing gay roles was seen as really like cutting edge and cool and neat but as a queer person he was cautioned against doing all of that and rocking the boat so a lot of this very Pisces vibes, but I can definitely see, um, the earth placements too, especially his, like, relationship with nature, um, um, some other things as well, but I won't, um, go on too much because if I do that, then I want to, I think, look into it too much and think too much about it, um, and then I'll have, like, a big murder board and It'll be doing too much. Um, but all that is to say, um, this is really wonderful and um, definitely fitting for Pisces and Mercury. I think that means that all three of the books that I've read for this blog's vlog have been five stars, which is amazing. I do have a few other things that I've been reading. Um, I did finish this up on audiobook uh, just because I was feeling very audiobook-ish. Um, and I wanted to finish it. But before that, I was working on Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. And I am loving it. But I know that this is one that I will want a copy of. And I think rather than finishing it only on audiobook, I'm going to take a break um, in order to get a copy. And then continue on with it. Um, we'll see when. Um, and then I've also been reading Plantains That Are Becoming, which I have mixed feelings about, uh, just because the beginning poem's really good, and then I'm getting to a point where a lot of the poems have a lot of, like, really liberal platitudes that I'm not vibing with, but I have a lot of ways to go, so maybe it picks back up. Um, and I actually started a romance novella as well pretty simple and cute so far. So those are the other things that have sort of been happening. And I need to decide which thing I want to read next for the vlog. Okay, so I think the next book that I'm going to read is Generations, a memoir by Lucille Clifton. Lucille Clifton was a black poet who was writing from I think the 60s and through the 90s. I have not read any of her before, um, 
but my partner and one of their friends, Betty, read this a while back and both really liked it. So I think it's going to be a good time. Um, Lucille Clifton's memoir is going to be for my Mars in Cancer. When we're looking at Mars, we're looking at action, ambition, um, how you respond to conflict and how you um, express your passions. Now, Cancer is a cardinal water sign. Cardinal signs are about action, starting, um, initiative. Uh, the cardinal signs mark the beginning of seasons, so like into new things. However, Cancer is still a water sign, so there's a lot of turbulence. It's very emotion focused. And um, because of these things, it can be a difficult placement for Mars. Um, in fact, Mars is at its fall in Cancer. Um, we talked about, I think, detriment and fall when we were talking about Pisces in Mercury. I honestly should go back and rewatch it um, just to make sure that I said all of it right because Pisces is, is in, um, or Mercury is in detriment in Pisces, but it's also in fall in Pisces, which is um, more difficult. Uh, and the reason that Mercury is like, different or has two in this way is because it has two rulers, Gemini and Virgo. Um, so it would be, you know, in rulership in both of these, but it is exalted in, um, Virgo, which is very good, very comfy, cozy. So opposite that is Pisces. <laughs> um, so it's really difficult. Um, in the same way, Mars is in its fall in Cancer. Uh, so it's really tough, um, because cancer is, uh, more moody, can be more emotional and strategic rather than, like, explicitly, you know, just kind of going. So cancer is represented by the crab. Um, and so in this way, the outside is very hard, uh, defensive, You've got the claws, um, even though the inside is very gooey and soft. Um, so cancer can be very withdrawn, not really forthcoming, and can be really defensive of the people that they love. They um, can also be moody and irritable, crabby, if you will. There can be a certain amount of passive aggression, and like I said, um, not necessarily just like I don't think that slow to anger is necessarily the most accurate, but it's like slow to action. Um, like they can maybe move in like smaller ways at times um, or take longer to do something. So Mars might do something like um, stay somewhere that they really probably aren't thriving in. Um, because they're afraid to hurt other people or afraid to let other people in to kind of know that they're in that sort of situation. In general, cancer is also seen as very motherly. It's ruled by the moon, so emotions, but the moon also tends to represent, um, like, mothers, motherliness. Um, there's another word that's just not coming to my mind. Um, but Mars in cancer is... I think very much more mama bear. So like, uh, not only, you know, acting in different emotional ways, like when people need it, but also kind of being on the defensive for others. And then, uh, my particular Mars is in the 12th house, which is about secret sorrow and self undoing. I think I might've associated it or like said that it was associated with death earlier, but that's not true. That's the eighth house but they're both kind of weird, dark houses. But anyways, internal um, can have to do with um, kind of more tough things, uh, but also more internal things and spirituality. So people with strong 12 house placements can be a lot about what's going on in their internal world, um, or they can be stuck in their internal world and need to kind of learn how to come out of that. And I know kind of other observations or like things that I've thought about in terms of Mars and Cancer and the particular way that I have it. Um, I 
have historically had a really hard time accessing anger. Like, even when people are, like, really fucked up to me. <laughs> like, it takes me a while to actually get angry. Um, shout out to, uh, the Tallahassee album by the Mountain Goats because <laughs> that taught me, listening to that on repeat really taught me how to be angry for myself. Um, but before then it was really a struggle. Um, so, uh, that's sort of a difficulty, uh, when it comes to myself. I feel like I can be, it's easier to be more angry at myself than at other people, um, in that sort of internal way, but it's also way easier for me to be angry for other people than it is for myself. So kind of the mama bear aspect, um, it's a lot easier for me to forgive you know, for things that have happened to me. Um, but there are some people who have wronged my friends. They may have forgotten about it or don't even think about that person. They're still on my shit list. So that's Mars and Cancer. And with these things in mind, we can go to looking at Lucille Clifton's birth chart. So I chose Lucille Clifton because um, she has a lot of cancer placements. Um, I don't think that we have a birth time, so we don't know the rising sign situation, um, which is one of the reasons why I didn't do her for my cancer rising. And when I do my book for cancer rising, I'll explain further too, because there are other reasons that aren't relevant right now. Um, but Lucille Clifton is a cancer son also Cancer Venus and Cancer Mars. Um, her moon is in Libra, which we love, uh, you know, Venusian. There are several signs that I think poetry makes, like, sense for to me. One of them is, um, Pisces. Another one is Libra. Or, really, I feel like people who are, um, Venus ruled, so that'd be Libra and Taurus. Um, both of them have at least to me, like, it makes sense that they would be into the arts and that, uh, the arts would be a way for them to express themselves, especially we've got Moon and Libra. Um, so this stuff is probably going to be, uh, quite emo- well, I mean, about her emotional experience, but I mean, it was going to be emotional because she has three placements in Cancer. Um, Mercury and Gemini, which is really good. Mercury is ruled by Gemini, so that's a good placement to have, uh, especially for communication. So with Sun, Venus, and Mars in Cancer, I kind of wonder if that leads to kind of an easier expression of that Mar of that um, Mars, especially with the Mercury in Gemini. I'm trying to see what um, kind of aspects we have. Her moon is trying Mercury, so I'm probably right about... Um, kind of like expressing emotions in that particular way there aren't too many there aren't too many other aspects um the big one is going to be mars and venus and the sun all of them opposite the north node um which i'm sure i could have thoughts about if i like kind of went down that rabbit hole but i don't think i'm going to right now i don't have much more to say about her chart necessarily and i don't really know a lot about her as a person, but I'm excited to see if any of this or how this affects um, the book and I'm excited to read it because it's come highly recommended.
I finished Generations, and um, this was really good. It was a quick read. I read it in a couple of hours, and it was a really compelling, um, fairly small look at this family that feels really big. Like, you don't, I think, know you know select personal details but it's not like a huge swath like a big epic but you still get um kind of a lot of connections um one of the things i was thinking while i was reading this was one of the uh kind of astrology things that i saw or like talked about with cancer um one of one of the books that i'd read mentioned you know, water as kind of central to, um, or the metaphor of water as a good way to look at Cancer Mars or the way that kind of anger works with Cancer. But of course, that's specifically looking at Mars and this author has several Cancer placements. Uh, Mars is neither here nor there, but the water metaphor works really well when looking at the way that the story was told. The author's um, I think two greats grandmother serves as the sort of starting point and you get a lot about her and as you go back through the story it still all kind of comes back to her kind of in the same way that you know with water you have more separate waves but um, the waves do kind of come sort of back where they came from and they're all made sort of with the same stuff there's a sort of fluidity in understanding like what you would point to um in terms of what like the parts of an isolated wave I don't know if that makes sense it makes sense in my brain um but the storytelling is kind of like that um, it's very non-linear. You definitely go back and forth. It, it actually starts out when, um, a white woman gets a hold of the author and is asking about her family because she's trying to, I guess, like, find relatives or create a genealogy and she sees a connection from their last name. But of course, they're not related to her. They're related to the people that her descendants owned. Um, and it kind of starts from there and then tells um, Caroline, um, the author's great-great-grandmother's story. Um, she was born in Africa and brought over um, and had these various things that happened to her. And you kind of hear, like about the same thing multiple times but in these different situations um that kind of build on itself i think that it's in kind of a way that could be seen as like disparate or random but it ends up flowing anyways it's very cool like the way the way that she writes is incredible um and is able to build sort of in those ways despite it being really short like I read this in you know no time it circles back around um definitely to the grandmother but also um her ancestors and her place of ancestry there's this refrain um you come from Dahomey women which was a place in West Africa so in that way you know despite a lot of these other ancestors that aren't named they're also still wrapped up in this whole story and family legacy and each chapter is named after a different relatives so the first chapter you get caroline and son um which are looking at caroline um and you also get the first kind of look into the author's father's death that's another point that the story kind of goes back to the one of the big points that the story goes back to is kind of when this author uh goes back for her dad's funeral or like kind of the process of learning about um her father's death and going to his funeral but the first chapter is caroline and son the second chapter is lucy which would be the author's great-grandmother Jean, who would be the author's grandfather 
Samuel, the author's father, and um, Thelma, who's the author's mother. So, as much as this is a memoir, none of these actually focus on the author, and yet we still learn about her um, through this people and through these different things that she's learned about these different people. Um, and it's kind of interesting seeing what details get chosen, especially with something as short as this. Um, what details get focused on versus what doesn't. Especially, I think, looking at um, violence. Kind of at the starting point, we have um, a family that came out of slavery. So that really like intense systemic violence and kind of the hardships um, that this kind of main matriarch had to endure. They're sort of a cycling back to the story of her walking from uh, Georgia to New York as an eight-year-old, but also these um, other kind of instances of violence. So the author's great-grandmother is the first Black woman to be tried and hung in the state that she's in for killing um I don't remember if they were married or if he was the father of her kid um but like that was a big thing as I'm talking I think I'm realizing certain things about this so that is kind of another like big centerpiece and then the two men that are focused on her, the author's uh, grandfather and father, the author's grandfather died fairly early um, and was told or like said to be like crazy um, or wild and would do things like throw bricks at buildings without really much repercussion. And then also going to the dad, which is kind of another more central figure like i said you kind of go back and forth and one of the like main memories that kind of spans the book is his death um and there's mention that he was abusive in some capacity would like yell at his mom not at his mom at the author's mom at his wife um and sort of these different things and how that impacted sort of some of the people around the story. And I don't totally know what to make of all of it. While I was talking, I was sort of thinking about the fact that um, Lucy, the first Lucille, there are three different Lucilles, uh, the author's great-grandmother, the author's aunt, and her. And the first Lucille was hung for killing this white man. The second Lucy um, is sort of berated for not reaching out to the author's father, despite him like really talking her up and reaching out to her. So she's berated for these things. Meanwhile, you have these two men who kind of enact violence in these different ways without repercussion. But then I also feel like there's another layer, maybe looking at more, um, with the systemic violence that I, I mean, there are a lot of potential things to connect. Um, I sort of feel like I'm babbling a little. It really gives you a lot to think about. And it also makes me think of kind of the role of violence, you know, within other things personally and how I don't I don't think I can talk about these particular connections on here just because I, I don't particularly want to in like sort of a public forum kind of meditate uh, with too much particular detail but but to say that part of this and the way that violence is and not just violence in like literally hitting people or killing people that's like the most extreme end but even um sort of like wrongs in these different ways the way that they're talked about in like a familial context I found relatable on a certain level 
Um, and I think that also speaks to, now that I'm like saying all this, it kind of speaks to the, the cancer, um, cancer and Mars, um, because it's sort of talked around, um, or like brought up, but not really addressed, you know? So that particular theme is very interesting, but I have a hard time articulating very much of it. Um, I also think that it's interesting. Um, I feel like there were some differences in the ways that different parts of the story were told, I guess, in terms of emotion. I thought it was also very interesting the way that the author did talk about the stuff that did involve her, which was more towards the uh, later part of the book and the way that she kind of reacts to these different things throughout her life is very, um, uh, very apt for someone with so many cancer placements. Um, so I thought that was funny and interesting in the context of, you know, this vlog and stuff. The other thing that sort of struck me about the way that some of this was written too is the fact that there are certain parts, granted some of them use quotes, but there's still a lot of like, I speak in some places that aren't necessarily the author speaking and that sort of like fluidity um, between people within the family, between generations in that way was really interesting. Um, and would also make this difficult to read in audio form. So <laughs> maybe consider that. Um, I don't even know if this is an audiobook. I don't know. There was just a lot of layers to this. Um, and I don't know that I've done it any justice sort of elaborating just on the things that stuck out to me. But I really, really enjoyed this. I loved the way it was written. And I loved that it was able to have such an interesting kind of picture of this family and how like different pieces of how they impacted each other um in such, such such a short span of time i feel like i still have a lot more to think about and that can be unpacked from this book um which is just so cool i love it when books can do that so i've got to think about what i even have left <laughs> um so we've done Pisces Sun, Aquarius Moon, uh, Pisces Mercury, Cancer and Mars. So I think that leaves me with Cancer Rising and Aries Venus. So I've got to pick which one of those I want to read next. That is where I'll be stopping for part two of this vlog. Part three should be up pretty soon.